Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Welcome to another of these webinars that have been presented by the American Iris Society this winter. Um, we already had one talk from this speaker last week, and I know many of you heard that, and it's good that you're back again for a second one. Uh, but if you didn't, uh, Carol Wilson is a research botanist at the University of California, Berkeley, and she's had a long-standing interest in the taxonomy and evolution of viruses. Uh, last week, she talked about how you would go about identifying a new species of an iris and describing it using some examples from China that she's familiar with. And now she's going to talk a little bit more generally in some ways about the sort of history of iris taxonomy and current thinking on the evolutionary relationships within the group that underlie the taxonomic system. So with that, I'll pass it back on over to you, Carol. Okay, I'll thank you and Bob for the introduction. I'll get my, um, uh, where did it go? Okay, I'll get my seminar up there. It was just up. Um, Oops. And show. I uh, sorry, I always get too many screens going for some <laughs> reason. And I don't know why. No worries. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, so there. Um so there is it showing as a slideshow. Yes, perfect. Oh, very good. Yes. Very good. So uh, thank you for having me back. And um, this time I have fewer slides. And so I'm thinking that I might get more questions as we go along. So somehow I'll try and figure out if I am getting questions or Andy will um, kind of see if we're if I'm getting questions. But um, today, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the historical taxonomy and then also kind of show a recent tree and then go through the steps of how one might interpret it. So, and I put on the front this time uh, a really favorite iris of mine, um, one of the Ibericas. So, and in the back, my background, there's Iris Iberica elegatissima. I like to feel like I'm someplace out in the field, right? I'm just here in my home, but um, we're going to pretend I'm in Turkey where there are so many irises. So. so what I'm going to talk about today is what is a phylogeny? And then where does iris fit within flowering plants? Just an overview. Um, of you know where it fits within flowering plants and then exam a few examples three examples of historical iris classifications and then show you some of the problem taxa at first i called them problem children and then i realized you know they're really only problems and classifications so maybe i better change that and call them problem taxa in classifications and then kind of go through a uh, a tree that I have worked on recently and kind of talk about tree talk, you know, how, how do trees work? How should we interpret trees? So um, a phylogeny, it's just a hypothesis of the evolutionary history of organisms and it's usually shown as a tree. And I think sometimes people um, think of it as kind of the truth, but really it is just our best hypothesis at the moment. Um, the trees that I've been producing on iris have been surprisingly stable, although there are still a number of things that I haven't resolved. So, you know, I think given the stability of it, it's a pretty good hypothesis. And um, one of my favorite um, uh, phylogenetic thinkers was Simpson, so I put up his um, little phylogeny of 
trees and uh, of horses and he did it as kind of a tree not the same sort of tree we use now but he really felt that when we talk about um, taxa that we should think of them in an evolutionary way so he encouraged that so here's a phylogeny of flowering plants and um I'm just kind of pointing out in the blue box are the monocots. And of course, iris is a monocot. And in, um, and in uh, the, within the monocots is the order Asparagales, and iris is in that order. And the tree that I'll show you later, when I first show you the tree, I'll show you some aspects of the order. I included several um, things from the order. The other thing that's been interesting or is interesting is that the, you know, at the moment, the basal flowering plant has, has kind of hung in there as being this plant Amborella. And there are a lot of people who disagree with this, but there have been a number of studies that have shown it as the most basal plant. So, you know, at the moment, that's our working hypothesis is that it is. And it, you know, it, it doesn't really look like a, what I would have thought a basal angiosperm might look at, the plant itself. But certainly the flower it has male and female flowers, and it has a lot of parts which was hypothesized you know, a long time ago by Toc de Jean and others that in fact, um, we would have flowers that had a lot of parts at the basal part of the angiosperms. And oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is this tree is upside down. I usually produce my trees the other way, but this is by APG, the angiosperm phylogeny group. And this is how, they present their trees. You can go on their website, which is interesting. It's, you know, the angiosperm um, phylogeny group. And um, they have all these trees, all of these little trees here. You can look at trees of trees. So it can be kind of an interesting website, but um, the uh, base of the angiosperms are here, and then these are some outgroups in um, the other seed plants, the conifers and all that. So here's iridaceae. So I'm kind of trying to narrow it down to iris. And here's the iridaceae, and there are about 65 genera of iridaceae, about 2,050 species. This is from, um, this tree is from Goldblatt et al. It was a tree where they were talking about whether or not, in fact, where, where are the origins of iris? And they uh, made an argument that it was Austral, uh, Austral Asia. <laughs> so they were feeling that that is where it um, came from based upon you know, some um, biogeographical analyses that they did. But I've put some blue things in to kind of draw your attention. Um, that's the color I used last time. I'm continuing with that. So if you notice here, it says eroidee, and um, then it this arrow points to this. So this is an expanded, you know, this is showing it's just one branch, but this is, is the rest. This is that branch. This is everything in in um, in that group. And um, here is the beginning of the iridaceae. I've put a blue dot. So everything inside of this blue dot, including all of these, are in the iris family. And everything below it is what we call outgroups. And those are just groups that we use in order to determine what the base of the tree is and what some of the basal, what some of the um, ancestral characters are for them. So, and you know, it's interesting because when you look at trees and you see it, you won't see it so much in the tree I'm showing tonight because it's, I'll explain later, it doesn't have it's missing quite a few species. I had to do that. Um, but when you look at the base of trees, you always kind of have these things that stand out by themselves. And 
Um, the, it's a pattern that you see in almost all phylogenetic trees. Here we have a bunch in purple and they, they seem not to have very many relatives or, you know, they're a small group like the Pattersonia is a, just a couple of species. Isophysis, which is thought to be the earliest diverging um, Iridaceae, it's a single species within the family. And here it is over on the right. But you always see kind of this pattern where you don't have, you have these single things or just a small, um, very small groups at the base. And you see it again here at the base, in fact, of the Iridoidae. So it's kind of a pattern that you see. And I just wanted to point that out. So then um, moving onward, you know, here we have the group that in fact um, Iris is in. It's in this clade. And um, here it is right here. And in this study, they chose to have Bellum Canda and Pardenthopsis as separate genera. But, you know, all of these are within Iris. So the um, iris actually begin here. And then you see that there is, so here's, here is where the ancestor to Aunt iris is. Here is its most recent ancestor. And here are all of the members that would be within iris in this tree. And there's something that we call a sister group or a sister clade in terms of trees. We tend to call them clades. And these are, are the groups that are most closely related to iris based upon them sharing a, an ancestor. So here's the ancestor and you can see that two branches come out and one leads to iris and the other leads to these um, uh, South um, African uh, species, mostly South Africa. So that's kind of where iris fits within the Iridaceae and where it fits within um, angiosperms in general. And then moving on to kind of some of the historical uh, uh, taxonomic groups. Um, Baker in 1892 had 148 species in his in in his treatise and he divided them into two groups those with rhizomes and those with bulbs. He wasn't really aware of those with tuberous roots or wasn't aware that they had tuberous roots. I kind of looked through his list and didn't see any tuberous root species, but I didn't look that carefully, so I'd have to go back and look. And so he had, and then under rhizomes, he divided them into those that have a beard and a crest, and those that do not have a beard or a crest. And so he had Limnerus and Pardenthopsis here, and he, these are all, I think he had them as subgenera. Um, and then he had Oncocyclus, Regalia, Lophirus, Pseudo-Regalia, and Iris. Um, he, he used the older names, but I use the newer names because it gets very confusing as you try to follow um, the names through time. So I didn't do that. But if you look, you know, he talks about the Apogons and the Pogons, you know, Apogons lacking beards, Pogons having beards, but I've given them their modern names here. And then he had bulbs where he had Scopirus, Gynandrus, Zip, and Ziphium. So that was in 1892 and 148 species. And then we get to Matthew in 1981, and he based his study on um, the work of Dykes, on, um, on the work of Lawrence, and he added in, in he added in Taylor's work, which broke some of the aerial, the, dealt with the bearded iris that also had arrows. And so he kind of used all three of those to come up with his idea of 
a classification, you can see there were, he included 250 species. And of course, he had many more um, divisions. And that's, that's one of the things you see. And that's, as you get more species, you kind of get a more hierarchical um, classification scheme. You know, we can only really hold, I think, so many ideas in our head at a time. And so if you have iris and it has 250 species, you know, you have to remember all the 250 species of iris and make sense of it. Um, it really helps to start subdividing it. So you can think of those with rhizomes and then you can think of those that have beards and lack beards. And that is really us trying to put order on something where there probably really isn't a whole lot of order but you know, it is us trying to come to um, deal with uh, remembering all of these different species. Carol, so, yes, we have a question. Uh, oh, yes. Can I ask for the question is, can I ask for classification on the difference between rhizomes and bulbs? Can, um, would you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood it. Can I ask for classification on the difference between rhizomes and bulbs? Um, well, a rhizome is an underground stem. Or clarification, he writes now. So. Right, so a rhizome is an underground stem and it grows along the surface or just under the surface of, of the soil and um, new shoots will come out of those rhizomes. So when you divide iris, which probably most of you have experience in doing, you know, you, you dig up that underground stem and you divide it up and then you replant them. So we call those renewal shoots. So the renewal shoots and the food storage happens in this underground stem and that's called a rhizome. Now with bulbs, Bulbs are actually, I wish I'd thrown in a, a picture of this. It would have been easier and I have lots of them. Bulbs are actually leaves. So they're overlapping leaves and you know they make this usually kind of round thing. And I do have a picture later of a bulb although it's not the best for demonstrating this. Um, and so the renewal shoot will come from the bulb and food reserves are stored in that bulb as well. And so it's a difference of whether you have an, an underground stem or an underground collection of storage leaves. So is that kind of clear? And I hope that was what the question was, so. Yes, he says, thank you. Oh, great, great. And, and then of course, tuberous roots are where you have a root and it has a swelling either. It's, it's there are root tubers and tuberous roots. And um, in the case of tuberous roots, you have a, you have a area of the root that swells and becomes a tuber. So um, yeah, so, so you know, irises have those. And I'll show an example from the Nepalensis of the tuberous roots. Plus you see them in the, in the Scopiers or Junos also. So anyway, so what I wanted to point out with this slide is just that as you get more species, you get a more complex classification. And Matthew's classification is, you know, is really, um, is, the classification that I always turn to, you know, when I'm working on irises. So it's really held up fairly well. I mean, it is not, there are exceptions, but it's a nice um, starting point, um, really points out a lot of differences in morphology between these different irises. And I've really appreciated it, so. And then across the bottom there, you have the different subgenera, Limnerus, Iris, Hermodactyloides, Scopiris, Ziphium, and Nepalensis. 
And those are the modern names for that group. So Matthew used those names in his classification. And then we have Rodeninko in 1961. Now he recognized at least in his classification, he said that he recognized a lot more species. He recognized about 300 species, excluding the bulk species, which he, I think he mentioned there were 34 or 43. I'm kind of uh, very great at uh, turning numbers around. So it would be one of those. And, um, and so he recognized or at least talked about more species, but he did exclude all of the bulb species. And I'm going to look at the diagram on the right because it's an easier diagram to understand. These are the things that he included within Iris. So you have the Nepalensi and he shows a nice picture here of the tuberous roots. He included Zeridian and Limnerus, Iris, Crossiris, and Pardenthopsis. So he, in, he included all of those groups and he kind of showed a tree showing how, um, you know, they may have evolved. You know, it's not a very detailed tree, but it's kind of his idea of where um, they may have come from. So then I want to go back to his more complex tree. And this was in the 1961 book. Now he has updated his classification. And so this is not his final classification, but um, this is really the one where he talked more about evolution, I feel. And so I think for this talk, it's good to look back at the 1961, although I, I wouldn't you know, I, I acknowledge and, um, you know, that he has updated his classification quite a bit based upon new molecular data. So, um, so where I put these little dots here, these four dots, you can see that he has these dashed lines that don't actually connect anywhere. And those are in fact, um, those are in fact the rhizomatous or the bulbous species that he did not include within iris. So you have um, the Juno or um, Scorpirus and you have uh, Hermodactyloides, which actually is not bulbous, but it has a tuber sort of like a bulb. And I'll show a picture of that later. And then you have um, uh, Gynandrus, um, which is a species that most people don't put within iris, um, but a few people have. And so he has it nicely outside of iris. And then you have here um, the Cyrodictium, which is the reticulatus. And he's showing this coming kind of from this vague area, uh, having to do with a cross between a crocus and a zeridian. So where he has these little round dots, these are where he feels there was some sort of hybridization or he's hypothesizing that there might've been a hybridization that um, led to these unique forms. And here's the Ziphium. So both the Ziphiums and the Reticulatus, he has kind of, you know, coming off here with Ziphium here and um, Reticulatus here. And then the other cross that he has is Pardenthopsis with Bellum candida. And we know people cross those two all the time. So they do cross, but sometime, somehow he, has, he, he felt that that really led to some of these other groups. But it's a little hard to kind of follow all of his thinking here. Um, you know, but remember that it was some time ago in 1961. But I wanted to point this out because I think it shows why he initially excluded the bulbous species. He really felt they did not arise from this kind of common ancestor that we call iris, although there uh, would have been some input 
here with the reticulatas in some sort of way. No, actually there isn't. So let me take that back. Yeah, there is with Zeridian. So anyway, it's, it's a little bit um, confusing, but I think you can kind of see where these came from. So um, now we're going to talk about all of these problem species. And so one are the one group is a bulbous species that in fact, um, Rodininko did not feel belonged in Iris. And he's, he made one comment that turned out not to be true. And I really kind of don't quite understand it from his diagrams in that he felt that maybe bulbs were ancestral. And it could be because of that line that seems to come from Crocus, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, since, um, after 1961, he did uh, decide that, in fact, rhizomes were ancestral because, um, you know, a lot of studies were coming along, mostly mine, that were showing rhizomes as um, being ancestral within the group. So here they are, um, Iris uh, bassiera, which is in the zipiums. I think it's one we don't really see very much. And so I put it in, it's mostly found in Portugal. Although there have been some um, populations in Spain as well. And then Iris reticulata, which is from the reticulata or iriodictium um, species here. And then Iris, here's Iris Persica, which is from um, is from the Scorpirus or Juno group. So they're all really um, great irises. I've grown quite a few of them. I'm sure many of you have as well. But he did not feel that they were in iris. And that's been something that he's felt very strongly about. So even in his current um, in his current classification, he does not in include them in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then there are some that just lack some iris features. So some people leave them out and some people put them in in the past based upon, and all of these are based on morphology, which everything of course was based on in the past. So you have iris domestica and it has this it does not have the iris flower. You know, it doesn't have that nice iris flower where you have basically kind of upright petals, more or less um, horizontal or deflex sepals. And, and then these nice um, petaloid uh, um, style lobes that you have here, you know, it lacks all of those. Although if you look very closely at the very tip of the style, it does have a little petaloid part. So you can, if you look closely at them, you can see that it does in fact have that. Um, it's just not that petaloid. And so it really does not look like an iris flower. So it was called Bellum Canda for a long time, and some people will still refer to it as Bellum Canda. And then you have Iris Dichotoma, which is the Pardenthopsis. And I think it was lots of times left out, mostly because it has this branching pattern, which is much more like Iris Domestica, not really very iris-like. It does have the um, petaloid um, style branches that you can see here, you know, which is so distinctive in um, irises. Um, you know, so it looks quite a bit like an iris other than that. These are both very tall, robust species, not, um, again, quite different, many multiple flowers, very uh, different from iris. And of course, these flowers are not very long lived either. And then you have this iris tuberosa, um, which um, is the um, group that um, Brodeninko left out because it has this um, tuberous root and it was Hermodactylus tuberosa. 
you know, so, and here's its flower. It has, it has actually a pretty irisy flower. It has these um, very reduced, um, actually this is one very reduced um, sepals, but that's not that uncommon in, or petals, that's not all that uncommon in irises. And, um, but it has these styloid, um, petaloid um, style branches. So, but that is one that people have left out of early classifications based on morphology. And then there's Iris Lozica. And Iris Lozica, if you just kind of look at that clump, it looks pretty iris-like. But if you look closely at the flower, they're not fused at the base into a floral tube, which the, you know, most irises at least have a short floral tube, but these are not fused. Um, here is the, here are the uh, petaloid um, style branches. So it does have petaloid style branches and here's is where they're fused, but that would be, you know, lower down in the flower. And, but the unusual thing is really their stamens. They have three stamens, which is typical of, of iris and, but they have these fused filaments. So it has a very different looking flower when you look at it very closely. And so a lot of people left um, Iris Lassica also out of um, Iris. And so here's this tree that I'm going to talk about. Um, and you know, the rest of the time we're kind of gonna talk about this tree and I'm hoping to, um, you know, that you'll come away sort of understanding trees a little bit better. And this is a tree that I did. It's not published yet. It's um, part of a study that I'm trying to get the other part of it, uh, you know, finished up, the other part of the data set finished up and published on the Ziphium sun. And this tree, in this tree, um, I use a lot of outgroups, as you can see. So I use a lot of things from the from Iridaceae. Here they are. All of these are from the Iridaceae. But I also included all the other groups. You know, tried to have representatives from the other groups within um, the Asparagales. So um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that a lot of people have talked about the Doranthes as being kind of close to the Iridace Iridaceae. Um, my tree shows that that's probably not uh, quite true. And there have also been um, other studies that have concluded the same, so, but what I was looking for was some dates. And here I have a date for the iris at 33.8 million years before present. And um, there were, there have been a couple of other studies, um, the Goldblatt study, um, a new study by Lou et al. And my dates are kind of close to theirs, um, but of course they did not include very many iris. And um, the Goldblatt study, um, it, you know, it's hard to compare to mine because, in fact, he did not include iris domestica and iris dichotoma within iris. So he acted like they were outgroups. So it kind of skewed their dates, um, according to mine. But at least um, the other dates with the Asparagales and the Iridaceae kind of agree. And um, I'm pretty confident that I have a pretty good. Um, dating tree here. But what we're going to talk about then is kind of all of these iris. Um, yeah, is all of the iris here. I'll go through these different groups, which I've simplified here. And one thing I was going to say is I used this analysis called BEAST, and it's a pretty complex analysis. And for BEAST to run, um, it won't run to completion if you have too many taxa. And so I did have to cut down the number of taxa that I had in iris, although um, I did come out with a very similar tree, but 
What I'm missing are a few, like I didn't include Iris verna, which comes out over here with Iris dichotoma and domestica. And, um, you know, I just didn't include speculatrix, which kind of comes out on its own. Uh, because it's it wasn't that important to me to date some of those. So I just left them out in order to have a, an analysis that would run. And today I'm just using it kind of to talk about trees. So if you look at that tree in detail, what you really see are initially are three main groups. And on the next slide, I'll show you kind of how we decide that. But here I'm also showing you, so we have what I like to call the ornamented clade, although ornamented sepal clade, although not all of the sepals in this clade have ornamentation on them, but most of them do. So it's kind of nice to think of them as the ornamented sepal clade. And I've kind of continued with this idea of bulbs, tubers, and tuberous roots, just so you see kind of how those fit within iris and why I include them within iris. Um, in order to separate them from iris, and you have a, iris becomes a very small group. So, and I prefer a much larger iris. Um, genus, you know, so, and would, I'm hoping I get a few questions about that because there are alternative classifications like Rodeninko and a new one by um, Crespo, relatively new. So, you know, I'm, if people may have some questions about some of those, and you see that I have a couple of species that have either bulbs or um, some sort of tubers on them. And then, so this is what I call the ornamented clade, the non-ornamented sepal clade, although some of these, as we saw last time, the series chinensis, they do have crests, but most of the species in here do not have crests or, and none of them really have a real great beard. You know, a few have a few hairs, but no great beards. Cristata down here, of course, and Lacustris and Tenuous, have um, do have um, crests. So we have some crests in this group, but most of them are over here. And then we have as our third group, this series ungu unguicularis, and that's the iris lassica that was so different in flower morphology with the filaments that were fused partially. You're, they're easy to take apart. You can pull them apart quite easily, but they do have fusion there. So when we talk about trees, we talk about the earliest diverging lineage, and that's always the lineage at the bottom. In my, in my trees, it's at the bottom, but it's the lineage that's closest to the out group. And then, you know, we look from that. So here is the series um, Unguicularis coming off here. And then we have the other two clades, this one, which goes right up there, but wouldn't fit on the um, tree on, on a, the slide. We have, have a, a question? question from uh, Mary Hansen. What data okay. was used to generate the tree and how are the dates determined? Well, the, the data that was used to generate the tree was molecular data. And in this case, I, because I had to include a lot of, of out groups that I hadn't sequenced. I had sequenced, you know, quite a lot of the out groups, most of the ones within Iridaceae, but not the other ones within Aspergale. So I had to find genes where, you know, there were sequences. So I it's I think it's three plas three genes from the plastome or the the plastid genome that comes from plastids where chloroplasts are. So that's the data. And um, the way you date these is, this is called a secondary dating. So there are no fossils of iris. 
So what you depend upon are fossils in other asparagales. And someone had, you know, other studies had included the fossils and come up with some good dates. So you're looking at other fossils in monocots, basically, that are available so that you can hang an age somewhere on the tree. And so I um, look through all of the um, studies, there weren't that many actually, there were two studies that actually used fossils. Um, I looked through those and uh, chose dates based upon what those studies had found for my asparagales and my iridaceae and, and one of them actually had something else. It had a couple of things within the asparagales that I could also put a, a fairly firm date on. And then from there, I was able to do an analysis which, um, which dated, you know, which projected hypothesized dates for all of the branches of the tree. It's it takes a long time and that's why, why you have to, it takes the computer a long time. It ran for several days um, on a mainframe computer that uh, NSF um, gives me access to. Um, so, you know, it is a big program and it does, that's how you get a date. I, I hope that's kind of understandable, but it's molecular data and I don't have fossils in iris, so I rely upon some ages out there. We'll go back a moment. So I'm looking, some of these branches were dated. The Asparagales was dated, the Iridaceae was dated, but also um, some of these uh, were dated. So I put all of those dates on as um, dates and then ran my tree and it it didn't accept those dates exactly, so it adjusted them based upon the data that I had. Um, but it tries to find that sweet spot um, using those dates that are kind of, you know, have at least been reported and are based on fossils and incorporating the new data to fit. So does that kind of make sense? Uh, and there's a follow-up uh, by someone else. By molecular, do you mean DNA? Yes, DNA, sorry, it's all sequence data. Um, you know, early on, some people use proteins, but, um, you know, now the standard is more to use um, sequence data. And these, and so our markers are certain genes um, that, that we have um, sequenced, and so we know the sequence of those markers, or certain genes, or in this case, it was actually uh, regions um, between genes, because they're more variable. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm getting questions. I, that's what I had kind of hoped to do. So I told you that I would sort of explain kind of how we look at trees. So this is again looking at that early, earliest diverging lineage, um, which is Iris lazica, which is also Ceres unguicularis, which is how it was labeled on um, the other plant. And when people recognize it as a separate genus, it's got the name Siphonostylus. So it has you know, several names, um, Siphonostylus, um, Ceres unguicularis, and um, I chose the species Iris lazica. I also have um, sequence data from Iris um, unguicularis. So um, I could have used that, but I've always kind of liked my Iris lazica um, data. And um, then, so here is the earliest diverging. And so I put a little circle where there, where the ancestor of, of all three of these lineages or resides. So this was the ancestor for all three of these lineages. And people lots of times say, well, what happened to the ancestor? 
And, you know, we don't really know what happened to the ancestor, um, the, but this um, hypothesized ancestor has a suite of characters that are kind of common to all of these. And so, you know, we kind of know what it might have looked like if we're looking, working with morphology or what its DNA sequence might have been if we're working with DNA. So that's how we kind of assign an ancestor. And because these dates are old, um, that, that ancestor would no longer kind of exist exactly as it was then. Okay, so, um, you know, so it has changed over time, but we don't, you know, we don't really have a name for that ancestor because we assume it no longer exists. Uh, so hopefully that, I know that sometimes causes some concern amongst people. Hello. So, so oh yeah. <laughs> so a more questions. Go ahead. But finish your, finish your oh. thought. Here. So I was just going to say that this ancestor gave rise to two entities. We always see it as, as something that has diverged and it has diverged into two. And um, and we can talk talk a little bit about that if people have questions about that. And then, so it has given a rise to something that is like this little blue dot. And then, this ancestor um, diverged again, and it gave rise to the non ornamented and the ornamented sepal clade, which I've represented here by Iris camieris, which has a nice beard on it, and Iris tenax uh, subspecies clamthensis, which is a beardless species. So questions now. Well, well one of the questions is, what is a sepal clade? Oh, okay. Oh, um, it's the ornamented sepal. And then it's the group of plants that have, where most of them have ornamented sepals. Does that make sense? And we'll look at it again. And then the other question is from uh, Bob Preece, and it's if the DNA is plastid DNA, then aren't we really looking at plastid evolution? And could you have parallel evolution of plastids due to similar environmental challenges? To the first question, yes. We are really only looking at the maternal lineage. So, you know, we are only looking, because because in um, almost all flowering plants, in fact, I think all flowering plants that they know of, um, the, the plastids are, they are within the egg. Okay, so they are kind of part of that apparatus and are passed down through the female and um, the, the sperm nucleus is, you know, that's a much smaller package and doesn't really bring along, um, you know, most of the time any kind of plastids with it. So yes, we are just looking at the, at the plastome um, data. Now, in my studies, I include nuclear data, but when you're trying to assemble a data set where you're trying to put together a lot of data, lots, you know, from a lot of different studies, which were not yours, um, all of them, you end up using the plastome in plants. And in fact, you know, a lot of my studies have used just plastome data, and uh, that's because it's much easier to obtain. You know, my current studies include a lot of nuclear data, but it is challenging. And as far as them, the it turns out that the plastome, um, the the plastome is a pretty conservative um, 
genome. So it's its own genome. You know, it was, it came into plants as a cyanobacteria, is that where the evidence is. And so it's its own and then got incorporated within the plant cells. Um, so it is its own genome. And there's only one strand of DNA. And so there's not a lot of variation there. There's a single, um, you know, there's, there's a single strand. And so it doesn't, it doesn't go through quite as much pressure from the environment. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have variation to begin with. So what has to happen is there has to be a mutation. So you have a, a mutation happen, and then that mutation is carried forward. So, you know, you don't have the same kind of, you don't have as much convergence as you do as you have in the nuclear genome. Does that make sense? Um, thank you. And then there's uh, uh, another question from Chuck Chapman. What, when using plastid DNA, what about species of hybrid origin? Yes, <laughs> they call that um, plastid capture or plastic, you know, plastic capture. And yes, you can, um, if you have hybridizations happening, um, you, you know, you definitely, just like nuclear DNA, you could have some sort of a preference for the for the new DNA that has come in, whether it be in the nuclear DNA or in the um, plastid DNA. And so you could have the population shift over time to that, um, that new plastid DNA just through, um, you know, through gen every generation, you would have more, um, more um, seeds come from those plants with the new plastid um, DNA. You can have that happen. Um, it's very hard to tell with just plastid DNA. Um, you know, my trees so far, you know, have not had a lot of spurious um, results, but I, you know, I can't know for sure that I don't have a hybrid in there. Um, you know, it's something that when you start adding nuclear DNA to the mix, um, you can more easily figure out if in fact you have a hybrid. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying you can more easily determine that. And, and then he asked, would this not give an inaccurate phylogeny? Um, you know, it gives you one story. It gives you the story from the female. It is definitely an evolutionary tree based upon um, inheritance through the female line. And I feel that it's pretty accurate. I do feel it's incomplete. And that's why, you know, attempts are made to incorporate nuclear DNA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. So now um, I wanted to talk about the two, you know, the two major clades, those with um, mostly unornamented sepals, which we have here. And I'm not showing you um, the bulbous species here in this picture because you just saw them, but I did want to show you some of the other species that you find. So along the bottom here, we have representatives from this 
group. And again, you know, it's kind of not a very filled out group, which we find lots of times at the bottom of a tree. And there have been a lot of speculation about why that is true. And probably the best answer is that, um, that, that there have been extinctions. So those, those lineages began at an older time in general. And so we probably have lost a lot of things from the bottom of our tree. Now, there's another reason why my, this one looks a little, um, a, a little empty down here. And that's because I really haven't um, looked a lot at things that might be related to gracilipes. So um, there are probably other things that are related to it. Um, and, you know, I, ha I, I have some holes in my collections for sure. And uh, the tenuifolia, the series tenuifolia is one of them. And some of those have some descriptions that mean they may go elsewhere. So, so I'm not saying I have everything here at all, but um, this pattern is not unusual. And it probably is due to the fact that at these ages right here where we had development of these, you know, probably we have also had a fair number of extinctions. So I think that's one of the better um, arguments for that. And, you know, there've not been the innovations too. As you go through time, you have innovations and, um, you know, these can lead to big speciation events. So I, you know, I think there are a number of reasons you can think of. So, and then in the subgenus Limnerus, I just put in another heart, uh, Hartwigii subspecies Australis and Iris sensata. But I think we're all familiar with uh, many of those, you know, Siberica, um, you know, there are many things in subgenus uh, Limnerus, um, you know, that, that would fall in there. The hexagonies tend to fall in here. Um, in fact, I had one in one or two in my study, and it is in this group. So, so they're subgenus Amnerus by the size of the triangle. You know, it's a pretty big group. Now, I did put an arrow by Ceres chinensis because this has been a confounding group, and I talked about it last time in terms of new species and. Uh, you know, I think there are a couple of additional new species. Certainly, there's a little bit of uh, confusion within the group. Um, so uh, that might become a slightly larger clade. But it has sometimes fallen in some of my studies that falls within subgenus Limnerus without much support or it falls outside of subgenus Limnerus. And you can see by this really short branch. There are not a lot of character changes here that we find in groups that diverge later. So, you know, or, you know, so some of these cannot be placed here, you know, so it just doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of changes along this branch. And um, yet the branch leading to Chinensis is, ni is nice and long, so it's very distinct. And certainly its morphology is, the morphology of the group is distinct. I've gone to where I can pick those out quite kind of easily, which is nice. Um, but I think that is still a little bit of a mystery as to where it belongs. And you can see that again, where you have a short branch here. There's just some confusion right in here. And um, you know, it just requires more data, you know, to, to kind of get that. But as I said, this was a little bit of a restricted tree because I was looking for data that I could find for all those other things in the Asparagales. And then we have the Spurias. And Iris um, Fodissima um, is related to the Spurias. I really like to consider them one clay um, with Iris Fodissima. Um, being part of the spuria group 
because I'm not, I don't think it really helps us to split things up too much. I think it, you know, because we're really trying to put some order on it. And um, I think it's better to have as large of a group as you can um, within re reason. So, um, so here's Iris Foidissima. This is one that I got in Spain. And um, then we have this group here, which I've spent some time working on and I'm working on them right now with um, uh, the person who's who was concerned, I think uh, Chapman about um, nuclear data would be happy because I have over a hundred nuclear genes, which is why it's taking me so long to sort everything out and get these studies out. But I have um, a sequence data back from all of these and I'm kind of working on them now. And these are all related. Um, it's interesting because we have at the base a plant that has bulbs and really has been thought to be in the hermodactyloides. There are a couple of other species that are related to it, um, but it's a small group as far as I can tell. And then we have this Iris mossia, and it looks very much like a limnerus. It um, doesn't really have a bulb when it is um, fully developed. Although, uh, you know, Dykes in particular talked about the fact that it forms kind of a bulb early on and then forms a rhizome. So, and that's one where I really have not had seeds, so I've not grown it, but I have, I did have it growing um, from a small piece of rhizome for a while. Um, and it is a very interesting plant. It's very unusual that it comes out here, but it has been coming out there since the first time I sequenced it. So, you know, I think that is a true story for it at the moment. And then we have the tuberosa, which has the tubers, and it ha was thought to be um, hermodactylus, a different uh, genus at one time. And then we have the two, um, uh, two of the main bulbous uh, subgenera. And they're pretty, hermodactyloides is uh, particularly large with quite a few named um, species and subspecies. Um, we'll see how that kind of sorts out. And then Ziphium is not a really that large of a group. So these are the, these are the non-ornamented, um, this is the non-ornamented clade, but as I said, some of them do have crests. So it's just a convenient way for me to think of them. And then this is the ornamented clade. And um, these are, all have some sort of ornamentation except for Iris dichotoma and Iris domestica. Iris verna, which also falls out in this area on a separate branch, um, does have kind of a very wimpy little beard if you look at it closely. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say wimpy because it is really an attractive and nice plant, but um, it is not it is also not as ornamented as the rest of them. So you have Iris japonica and Iris wadii, which is re uh, represented over here by a picture I took in the Berkeley Botanic Garden some time, uh, many years ago, actually. I don't think they have, well, they may have. This is the Johnson clone of it. And um, it has really been Iris japonica and Iris wadii and Iris tectorum, which comes out um, not within the group, but here, which is frustrating. And I did drop all those single little ones out of this study, um, but they look a lot like, you know, Iris lac uh, lactris and cristada and uh, tenuous. You know, they do look a lot like those, and they were put together, but. Um, they form the base of the two separate clades or the two separate, you know, those two separate clades, the ornamented and non-ornamented. So they really cannot be put together. And I think there's a little more work to do on sorting that out. Um, 
but you know, it's one of those oddities that comes out when you start including molecular data. You know, morphologically, we would put them together. And then there's subgenus Nepalensi, which is here uh, represented by Barbatulata, um, you know, which has a little crest of some sort, usually a ridge or a crest on it. Um, subgenus uh, Scorpirus, which um, has, again, kind of crests. They have a ridge or a crest on them. They're also a bulbous species, as you can tell. Um, and then here we have the bearded species. And I have them represented here, Iris teoka and um, Paradoxa, which is that unusual little one with um, the uh, sepals that are actually uh, kind of mimic bees and there's um, kind of, uh, you know, bees attempt to, um, you know, they think this is a female bee, so you have bees landing on them and um, pseudocopulation or, and uh, fertilization that way or pollination that way. So, so a very unusual plant, but this is a beard, as is this, it's just it doesn't have the rest of the sepal blade and suave lens. And then, um, there is this group here um, represented by Iris stolonifera, which has a very nice beard. It comes out within subgenus Iris very nicely, but it does have um, tuberous roots. So it's a little bit different from the other um, plants in the group. So, and I think this is about my last slide. So, yeah. Thank you. So I would take any questions now and I'll go back and we can look at slides or, um, you know, I had hoped that we would have a lot of questions and I'll talk more about data. I started putting in slides that also was about methodologies, but the talk was too long. And so I felt that I really couldn't, I would just rush through everything if I tried to do that. We can and, take another uh, another uh, presentation, Carol. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. I will. I need a little rest right now. And this is Iris <laughs> Perquidii from Syria. And uh, this was just such a lovely site to be at. So I'm yes. going to stop the screen share, but we can go back and look at any of the things that uh, you want to look at, or I can answer any questions. So does anyone have any questions for... Um, Carol Wilson at this point, and if not, it's okay. We okay. can just end it here as well. So, um, I, uh, we have one from Rodney Martin. If you want to unmute yourself, Rodney, and just ask it. Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to type this. Uh, <laughs> with uh, with respect to Crespo's uh, uh, taxonomy. Yeah. Uh, from my viewpoint, it seems like he just uh, shifted the ranks. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. He uh, did. Would you uh, just uh, give us your take on that? What makes it a what makes it a genus, and what makes it a a, a subgenus? Or huh. well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, of, of course, it is just. Um, a matter of opinion in many ways, but in many ways it's not because most people try to, um, the code, the nomenclatural code recommends that you, um, you preserve as much of the taxonomy as you can when you do a revision. And you know what, what has happened is people, some people, some systematists really don't like putting the bulbous species and bellum canda within iris. But if you look at my tree, you can't just pull those guys out because then 
you've broken the tree apart. Um, you, you know, then the nice relationship that I showed you where you have an ancestor and then it gives rise to ancestors that all gets all of those links get broken. And so the only way you can really remove the, the bulbous species and vellum candy out of iris is to break iris entirely apart. And that is what Crespo has done is, and um, you know, I think he likes small groups. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's funny because I'm working with him on the Ziphium, not on the Hermodactyloides, but on the Ziphium project because it's a Spanish group. And um, he provided a few of the samples from, actually his graduate student provided a few of the samples from Morocco. And so, um, but you know, we, I told them, you know, I really can't work with you unless we call them Iris. So it is a matter of, it's a matter of viewpoint, but it is strongly encouraged to try to preserve as much of, as you can of the, historical classification when you redo one. And, and that's certainly the way I look at it right now. People can recognize Iris. Um, and so I don't, I don't really agree with splitting it apart. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, I, one one uh, comment, maybe a, a bit of a question uh, from me. Uh, when you really notice that people are accepting that sort of thing, uh, where everything is split out into multiple genera, is when, going back to your, your talk last week, is when herbaria actually move those plants into uh, that taxa. And I don't see that happening. No, no it's, 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 not, it's not been accepted so far. And... Um, uh, most of the persons who work on iris and you know i'm the only i'm the only person that works on iris kind of broadly but there are a lot of people that work on smaller groups within iris and um you know in general they don't accept that classification i mean i'm in communication with them all the time so you know they really like a little bit broader um, classification. I think that the people from Russia are a little more torn because Rodeninko was did so much work in Iris, and he really did prefer having some of the groups um, outside of Iris. He was really disappointed, I would say, that it would require moving so many. But, you know, they have to balance that between their tradition of how to look at Iris through Rodeninko's work and um, then, you know, other work as well. So I think, I think their uh, people are a little more torn and I certainly understand it. Thank you. There's a couple more questions in the chat. Um, uh, Marianne Davis says, how do the Pacific Coast Iris fit in? Well, they're within Limnerus, so they fit in very nicely. They're the, they're the, what we would call the um, latest emerging group within, within Limnerus. So they're a relatively young group within um, Limnerus, yeah. And then um, uh, another question from Mary Hansen. What information do you obtain from, uh, I think she's saying from nuclear DNA in terms of molecular data? Well, the, the thing about their nuclear DNA is both great and awful, okay? Because, because there are two copies of every marker. So, what you're, it's very hard sometimes to sort all of that out and it can be challenging. And so like now I'm working with these very large um, sequencing runs and you get back all of this data and then you um, 
try to you 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 try to determine you know is the plant if the plant is a polyploid you have a lot of trouble but if you think the plant is a diploid then you can kind of sort those out um, because as long as it doesn't have as long as most of the nucleotides are the same um, for your marker. So you have some differences, but they're most the same. But it can be very hard to sort out. And the other thing that happens is just like the plastome has one evolutionary history, you have to kind of think of every marker that you use in nuclear genome as having its own evolutionary history. So you're not dealing with two evolutionary histories, the plastome and the nuclear marker. You're dealing with a lot of different evolutionary histories. So they can evolve differently. And you know, they're, along chromosomes, um, markers can be linked. And so then they will be evolving the same. But if they're not linked, they are evolving you know, based upon what chroma, chromatid you get. You know, so it, it is complicated. And so the, the program, you use some of the same programs, but you also use these other programs that try to get at, um, you know, how can we look at all these different histories and bring them together and make a summary of them. And so there's a place where sometimes you can find hybrids and things. Okay. I um, have a couple of comments, uh, the, just a couple of comments that say it. One uh, from Jeannie Jackson says, well, what a lot to share and understand. Enjoyed learning how the family tree is established. And uh, from uh, Dr. Alex Eva, thank you. Very detailed and with excellent illustrative material. It was very informative. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you. I, you know, I really, um, you know, feedback all always helps the negative feedback too, <laughs> you know, so um, because I, I feel as a, as a scientist that I, you know, want to really explain my things to the public, but I'm not, you know, scientists are not always very good at it. We're actually, I think as a group, we tend to be pretty introverted. And so, you know, it can be hard. <laughs> Yeah, so it, but I, I think it's something we should do. And I really try to every time I get a chance. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, when you're picking a, a sample to use for your run, uh, some of these species have a very wide distribution and, and a lot of variability with them. So when you're picking a particular a, a species to represent, just pick your, pick your one to represent the species. Are you running a risk of, uh, which, uh, actually, would you have a, a, a difference if you picked a different species or could you perhaps look within the species and try and find the most rooted uh, or most basal species and that would give you a more accurate uh, tree? Well, um, I, feel, I feel that what I'm producing, the kinds of studies that I'm producing is kind of like an outline and it's not going to encompass all of the variation that's present. And my hope is that someone will come along behind me and say, you know, this part of the tree could really use a lot of work. And that then they would incorporate, um, you know, multiple populations. Um, that's kind of, you know, the, the better way to approach it. And yes, then you might get a little bit different story because who knows, you know, maybe the one you chose is the outlier. Um, but, you know, because I'm kind of working across Cyrus, you know, I can't have that many. I don't have, you know, I'm not going to accomplish um, everything I would love to accomplish in my lifetime. So, you know, the goal is, is that you put out there some work and then people come in and, you know, really clear up all the mistakes you made, you know, so that's kind of the hope. Now, I am doing a pretty comprehensive study right now on the series Californica because, you know, uh, right now I'm in Portland, but, you know, most of the time I'm in Berkeley, which is kind of the center of the series Californica. 
And um, there I'm incorporating multiple populations. And for one taxon, in fact, I have 99, well, I have 100 populations with the main one. So I have one that's, and then 99 additional populations across the range. And then for the other species, I'm trying to have, you know, as many populations as possible. So I am doing that on a small group. And I think that's where you can do it. But meanwhile, I have studies going on on these larger groups where I really only have one or two examples included. Yeah. Um, there's another question in the chat. Uh, was full genome sequencing, uh, has full genome sequencing been done in irises? Well, actually, the one project that I'm doing in Iris, um, California, there will be a whole genome of Iris macrosiphon. You know, I've been working with UCLA on the sequencing part of it, but there will be they have quite a lot of experience, you know, I can handle um, markers, you know, 100 markers, I actually sequence 700 markers, and then I look for ones that worked across everybody, <laughs> you know, so I try and have around 100 that are good, good sequences across everybody. But they're going to do they're going to do the sequencing part of it. And then I'll, I'll be involved in the analysis and putting it together, but there will be a whole genome of iris macrosiphon. Actually, they have me scheduled, I think, for April, but I'm not sure on the sequencing run. So, um, and they've been, they've been getting it back, other people's pretty fast. So it will happen, but that's not something that I'm actually very interested in. You know, I couldn't I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I, you know, so I applied for the grant and got it. And then I wondered why did I do that? Um, because I'm much more interested in the natural history of groups and where that whole genome is going to be very useful are people who are, you know, want to know about specific genes for things. Yeah. Okay. There's a uh, uh, related question from Marianne Davis. Um, we don't think of plants as migratory species, but genomic information should give evidence about where a plant type originated and where, and perhaps when, it subsequently spread. Can you give us a sense of the iris origination and subsequent redistribution and the time scale in which this happened? Well, I did, I don't know it for all of iris. I just haven't, you know, done those uh, studies yet. But, um, you know, I, I did look at the, um, at the um, subgenus iris, and it really looks like it most likely, and I published that, it most likely originated in um, kind of in Asia. So in Asia, Central Asia, in that area. So I think, yes, those kinds of studies actually interest me a lot. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't have an idea for all of all of iris. It's a little bit, you know, iris lasica is from Turkey. It's from southern Turkey. Iris lasica is from um, that area. Um, most of the major clades in iris have at their base some from uh, Asia. So I think Asia is likely, but Iris Lasica is really that outlier and it's, it's very confusing, you know, so we'll see. I mean, I need a lot, I need to have my, the base of the tree better worked out and then I can do that, yeah. And then there's uh, Mary Hansen has a question. What markers are you using? You may have touched on that some. But... Well, um, in, in a lot of my past work, I've used, of course, placid markers. But with, the, with my present work, um, I did a, an RNA sequencing project. Um, where I sequenced RNA from, you know, petals and leaves and sepals and a whole bunch of parts of the plant, not all the plant. And then 
I, so what I was looking for, what you do then is you have expressed genes. So you don't have the whole genome. You just have the genes that are being expressed. And from that RNA data, I chose markers that seem to be in single or low copy. So I, you know, because along a chromosome or, you know, many chromosomes, you can have a gene um, repl replicated and, um, you know, there are many genes working at once to get all these products going. And so, you know, you, you don't want those because those would be really hard to work with. So I developed a set of markers and I, you know, there's, I think there's 635 of them. There's something like that. And, um, you know, I, I work with those and they're not, they're across the genome. So there are some, there's some interesting ones like some flower color um, genes in there, which I think would be of interest to people, but you know, they're just an assortment of genes, you know. Okay, um, and a follow-up question to that. Is there a specific journal in which you have published? I'm very interested in reading more about your work. Um, I, you know, I have published quite a bit in Taxon and I've published quite a bit in the, um, in the um, Systematic Botany because I'm a member of those societies. So I like to support them. I was also an editor at Systematic Botany at one point. Um, associate editor. So I do publish in those, but I've published in other ones too. The best place if people want to find um, where my work is, which none of my, I don't have my new work on markers out yet. So that will be a while. But the best way to find them is to look on ResearchGate and just search for me because I list all of my publications there and people can request them. So some of them, if they're open access, they're pres you know, I upload them, but the others you have to send me an email and I'm really behind on answering those, but every once in a while I just take a day on the weekend and just, you know, send out publications. So, you know, you can get publications that way if you don't belong to a university or have access to those journals. So it's just ResearchGate and my name. Okay, uh, then uh, there's a question. What is the time scale for iris on our continent making their way here from Asia? Oh, you know, I, sh I didn't, I didn't, um, let me look, okay? I actually have that tree right here. Um, let me close, it. whoops. Okay. And, you know, we, I, I guess we don't, you know, we can't say for sure that it came from Asia. Um, I mean, I think it probably came from Asia. Um, uh, let's see, where is that? In terms of that same question, um, I was looking at Ibis brevicalis, for instance. Right. And do you, I've, I've collected a, a very northern and different spaces across the United States before you actually end up down in Louisiana. So something like that may be useful too, right, by taking the different samples from different areas to actually give a time scale of possible of possible movement. Yeah, and um, brief Collis is one that I've never collected, although um, um, Alan Miro did send me um, a brief Collis, um, you know, I'm looking, I know I have that tree somewhere. It may, I may have to answer that later because I, I'm having some trouble actually finding that tree at the moment. Okay, um, maybe Marianne Davis can connect with you about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. uh, uh, the last question we have on the chat right now is uh, Bob Priest is asking, is there any use of artificial intelligence to sort data and typify different species? Huh, that's a good question. Um, No, not, not, not that I know of. Um, there, there are some programs that if you have data, you know, so a molecular data set or a morphologic, morphological data set, you can ask it to 
kind of look for differences and um, give you an idea of what you might name as a species. But I've never really done that. You know, it's not it's not something I've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a. But as far as being out there in the field looking for new species, um, there's this idea of a barcode. I'm sure you've kind of heard of that, where they felt that they could get a barcode for every species on the planet. And then you would take your little um, thing, which has not been developed, and, <laughs> you know, see what his DNA is and then, you know, I uh, know what species you have, but it's not been developed. So, yeah, so I don't know. For the next generation of taxonomists. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs>